AM 1240 WGBB.com and 1240 WGBB Freeport. This is Healthy Living Radio with your host, Dr. David Scharf, a compelling program featuring today's top health care professionals. Join us as we explore the latest treatments and technologies to provide better care in today's ever-changing world of health and wellness. Now here's your host, Dr. David Scharf. You are listening to Healthy Living Radio, dedicated to helping you live better, healthier, and longer. I'm your host, Dr. David Scharf. Thanks for tuning in tonight. Tonight we have a unique type show. We haven't had a show like this uh, ever in the history of Healthy Living Radio. Um, we have a very special guest, Dr. Steve Katz, a dentist in Malvern. Steve, thanks for taking time out to be Thank with you. us tonight. It's great being here. And uh, tonight's topic is a unique one. Uh, tonight we're going to talk about how to choose a dentist. And, you know, we've had uh, dentists on the show talk about cosmetic dentistry or sleep dentistry or TMJ. Um, but a lot of people have no dentist and they don't know where to start in choosing a dentist. And uh, the reason Dr. Katz is a unique guest, number one is he's a practicing dentist with a very interesting history, which we'll talk about, but also he's a coach and consultant to other dentists and he teaches them how to be successful. And to our listeners, you probably don't think that a dentist has to learn to be successful, <laughs> but uh, it's actually very difficult to be successful. So again, Steve, uh, welcome to the show. I appreciate you It's a pleasure being here. here. Thank you, David. So let's just uh, tell our listeners a little bit to start out, a little bit of your, your practice history, because it's an interesting one. Sure. I purchased a practice in 1984 from a wonderful dentist who had a tremendous following and uh, learned a lot from him and, and what patients want and within a private practice. Having been through residencies, I was aware of what it was through the clinical situations, but the running of a practice was, was quite different. And from the mid-80s up through the 90s, I was able to establish a very successful practice with a very good reputation. Uh, the practice grew to the point where it was a little bit too much for me, and I took in a partner in the late 90s and was able to watch the practice grow. But uh, encountered some personal tragedies along the way um, at that time. Uh, the first tragedy was I was in an accident, and that accident uh, created an injury that was going to put me out of practice for a lengthy amount of time. Uh, the day before I was in that accident, though, my partner had left the practice suddenly uh, because of some external personal pressures that forced him out of the practice, and uh, I was put in a situation where my practice was going to deteriorate and I was not able to do anything to restore it. Uh, on top of that, my partner had to go through bankruptcy and all of the debt that we had amassed in putting together our partnership uh, fell on my shoulders. Uh, it was a difficult time and it took almost two years for me to get back into practice. My practice, which had been highly successful, uh, was virtually lost and went down to nothing. And you know, just to interrupt for a second, because we were talking before the show about uh, just a little bit about your practice. Maybe you could just give our listeners a sense of, uh, uh, you know, you're a consultant to some sports teams, and you're not just your average dentist on the corner. I mean, you've got a very unique practice, and maybe just I know you don't like to toot your own horn, but just tell our listeners really what makes it uh, unique that way. Well, it's a it's a full full scope practice where we do a lot of the specialty work within the office. I had a very strong surgery background. And so we do our own surgery, our own periodontal surgery, um, place our own implants. Uh, I was very fortunate at one time to become the team dentist for the New York Jets, so sports dentistry became a big aspect of my practice in, in caring for a professional sports team. Uh, I also teach at North Shore Hospital, so that kept me up on all of the latest developments and kept my pr practice very progressive mm -hmm. through the years. Uh, and So to be out of practice was de very difficult. Uh, when I came, when I was just about ready to come back to work from my disability, that was when 9-11 hit, and 9-11 had a disastrous effect on most practices in the area and, and lives, and it affected many people within our practice, and that delayed whatever recovery we were able to start in 2001. And then the following year, when we were beginning to recover from that, one of the members of my dental team was struck by a car. Mm. And uh, as a result of that accident, she lost one leg, lost the use of, use of both arms, and was in a coma for six months. And even though we didn't have very much going for us within our practice, we still decided to dedicate the next six months of our lives to 
trying to help her. And over that period of time, um, my associate and I both uh, did not take draw often. Our team members uh, did not take pay. And whatever revenue we were able to create that was above expenses, we were able to donate to that young lady mm -hmm. so that uh, when she was recovered and came out of her coma and was able to start functioning, we were able to provide her with a hand-operated vehicle, a computerized prosthetic leg, and a half million dollars in cash. Wow, that's fantastic. That's really something. That's something. Um, and then once we accomplished that, my, my associate said, you, you say you, you like me, and she's a wonderful woman, Dominique Lizio. Um, and she said, but this practice is not going to support the two of us, so we need to rebuild the practice. And I had long been a student of practice management. I had gone to listen to all the gurus and all of the lessons that I learned from them along the way. I decided to put into practice in rebuilding um, what our practice has become, and it's a very highly successful uh, practice on the South Shore now. What are the factors that you think have contributed to the success of your practice? You, you, you know, it's sort of interesting. It's almost like a second marriage. You get to, you had that period, to, I guess, to reflect on your old practice and mm -hmm. maybe what made it successful and what you would change, and then you got to rebuild it in maybe a new vision or the same vision. But in looking back, what are the factors that you think made it successful? What you touched on with vision is a key part of it. It's, it's having some idea of where you want to be and how you want to get there and, and what are the decisions that you need to make along the way, uh, whether it's um, participating heavily in insurance or not and decisions having to deal with the type of team that you're going to assemble and the type of procedures that you're going to do and the type of facility that you're going to have. But you also have to have a real belief system. And uh, if, you, if you speak to dentists, throughout the country, and I get an opportunity to, to speak with quite a few, they can tell you what they do and they can tell you how they do it, but they can't tell you why mm -hmm. they do it. And that why is really the core of the belief system. And uh, it, you see it throughout society. Um, you see it in Apple computers. There are many companies that make fine computers, computers that are beautifully designed, easy to use, uh, easy to learn. But once they get through those qualities, there's not much that distinguishes them. Whereas Apple tells you they're going to um, make your life simpler, they're going to improve your life, they're, they're going to bring you to the next um, century in, in technology. And by the way, they just happen to make computers and people jump aboard their bandwagon. Uh, just on the way over here, I was listening to some commemoration uh, about Martin Luther King, and he's a, a an excellent factor of the of the belief system and why. Um, during the civil rights era, there were a lot of leaders who had been discriminated against while they were growing up, and who were wonderful speakers, but they were not able to uh, accumulate the following that Martin Luther King did because they talked about what they wanted to do and what they wanted to change, whereas he talked about having a dream and having that dream crossed barriers of gender and crossed barriers of socioeconomics and he developed a much stronger following that enabled the, our, our society to make changes that were meaningful. Do you think that some dentists just automatically start from a belief system and then work outward or it, it, does it have to sort of be a conscious decision to take a step back and say, well, this is my belief system and is what I'm doing congruent with my beliefs? Absolutely, you have to have the belief system first because what you use in a belief system or a vision, it's not just an exercise. It's using it as a tool that you then start to make decisions so that each and every day as decisions come up, what you do is you say, is this decision consistent with what my vision and what my belief system are? And if it's not, then it's not the right decision. So it, it creates consistency and it keeps you going in the right, right direction. Mm -hmm. Why do you think, in your experience, do most dentists start from that? the point of a belief system or that they just sort of wing it? Most of them are very self-conscious about the clinical aspects of it and don't necessarily take enough time in the beginning to look at the emotional aspect and be future-oriented in determining where they want to go with their practice. Mm -hmm. And it, it involves other things. It involves the type of people that you're going to select um, in your team. Um, are you going to take people who are caring or skillful or both and, and if you is one trainable to the other. 
skillful people are not necessarily able to make the transition to become the most caring individuals. Caring individuals and those with good verbal skills very oftentimes can be taught the skills. Mm -hmm. So when I teach dentists in hiring techniques, I always teach them for the emotional and the verbal abilities more, th more so than the clinical. Mm -hmm. You know, when you talk about starting at the point of a belief system, give our listeners an example of in words what that means. Th my belief is this, and because of my belief, this is what I would do for a patient. When we talk about the vision of our practice, and, and we recite the vision statement almost on a daily basis before we start our day, the first part of that belief system is that we are going to create the best service that patients will ever receive in a medical or dental facility. And so that everything that we do from that point forward, and what we're going to do is ch try to change lives. We're going to use our skills and our training to make a difference in people's lives. And there are so many ways that we can do that in the field of dentistry. Mm -hmm. So so how would how would your action differ, say, from a dentist who has no belief system like that? Do they just think more locally, okay, I have this you know, a decay in a tooth that I'm going to repair as where maybe you would take a step back and assess the whole mouth or approach it differently? Our approach to patients is very different. I'm much more concerned with the relationship than what their technical and clinical needs are. So when a patient comes into my office, uh, before they are ever taken into a clinical area, we I sit down with them in a, in a private office and I get to know them. We spend 15 to 20 minutes talking about their family, their job, the things that they're interested in, what are the things that concern them, what are the things that are concerned about their, their dental condition. Um, in dental school, you're taught to care for the chief complaint, which is a condition in most patients. It's a broken tooth, it's a discolored filling, it's decay, it's a toothache. But quite honestly, my experience has shown that patients aren't so interested in what we're going to do for that chief complaint or condition that they come that they've come for it's easy for them to say i need you to look at this particular area but they they really don't know or care that much about specifically what we're going to do what they're concerned with is how does that condition affect their life the person who has a toothache is concerned with the fact that it's distracting them when they're at work so they can't concentrate that they, they're distracted when they're trying to help their child with their homework at night. They can't concentrate on their homework. If they're in pain, it's keeping them up. They're not rested. It's um, a missing tooth is, is a reflection on their integrity if they're in a business situation. Uh, somebody who has a loose denture is concerned the fact that it jumping around, they can't enjoy themselves on a game of tennis because it's moving around. Discolored fillings in, in a woman who's um, maybe a divorced single mother and she's trying to meet somebody else in her life and when she smiles these discolored fillings become a focus for somebody looking at her. And so what she's not, she's not concerned with the fillings, she's concerned with some self-esteem issues and some dignity issues that are affecting her that way. So that what we need to focus on is the disability, the emotional disability that these conditions provide for the patient. And that's what draws them into our offices for care. Mm -hmm. When we prescribe treatment then, our treatment should be how we're going to effect on that disability, how we're going to restore their self-esteem, how we're gonna restore their ability to function without distraction. When patients are approached like that and you've made a connection to them emotionally in this type of a way, they become much more receptive and appreciative for the treatment and they have a much greater perceived value of the care you're rendering. So it, that creates even a stronger relationship. In your experience, do most dentists take this approach with patients? It's a huge paradigm shift and unfortunately so many of the doctors now are facing the pressures of uh, commoditization and insurance reimbursement and needing to <coughs> spend less time, do procedures quicker, cutting corners, and they're much more concerned with the bottom line, unfortunately, than the real purpose or, or vision or belief system that we came into our field for. You know, um, what appeals to me about the approach that you take is you form a relationship with your dentist. So 
you know, one of the definitions of a professional is that you rely on them to the point where you let them make decisions that you're not qualified about yourself, that you can't make for yourself. Your accountant, your attorney, your physician, as much as they can tell you the nuts and bolts of what they're deciding, you're relying on their expertise. And you know, what appeals to me about your approach is that you establish enough rapport with the patient that there's a level of trust developed. And what I've observed with those uh, the scenario you des- describe where the dentist sits down, there's a hole that's filled, is there's never that trust developed between the patient and the dentist, and ultimately that affects the patient's health. As I go into offices, I, I usually observe the doctors working and their team working for a, a half a day before we start working with them, and it's it, it floors me when I see how little the doctors know about the patients who are sitting in their chair. They're treating teeth, they're not treating people. When we have that initial interview, with between myself and a patient, one of the things that I do with them is I tell them how important the relationship is. And then I do something that I call the permission statement. I tell them that because the relationship is important, I would like their permission to be able to be truthful and honest with them and tell them what I see and how I would like to take care of it for them. Mm -hmm. However, I grant them permission to make all the decisions. It's their mouth. I respect that. There are things going on in their life that may affect what decisions they make. And together we will come up with some solution that fits their needs as well as what is best for them. What What are patients' typical responses when you have that conversation with them? Because I would venture to guess that very few people have had that conversation with a dentist. You see it in their posture. When you're sitting across the table from them, Inevitably, they start off very tense. And as you're having this conversation and, and you're sitting at the same level that they are and you're eye to eye and, and you're communicating in that way, you start to see their posture very, become very different. They become more relaxed. They start to lean in instead of leaning away from you. We see phobic patients, and we treat quite a bit of them because we do sedation. We start to see some of them relax and where they've come into our office Uh, insisting that in order to be treated, they require sedation, we find that this approach relaxes them to the point where then they can almost proceed with treatment without being sedated, and they're still relaxed and and confident. Because they have a whole other level of trust. Correct. What do you think is the biggest mistake people make in selecting a dentist? Well, I made a few notes on um, some of the things that, that patients should look for. And it's not to settle for less than knock your socks off service. Mm -hmm. Um, People in every aspect of life today have become accustomed to lousy service. You get it when you call some of the utility companies, um, the the way you're dealt with on the phone, the way you're made to wait, when you have all these automated systems. And the first thing that they need to be impressed with is right from the get-go, what is that first impression that you get from from an office? how do they answer the phone? You know, is it cheerful? Is it welcoming? Um, do they do they exude a, a feeling of quality there? Do they feel like somebody that will go out of your, their way to make you comfortable? That should be the first. Then it should be some sort of a relationship building between not only the doctor but the team as well. Once an appointment is made in my office, what I like to do is if I see a patient is coming into my office for the first time, I will call the patient the night before their first appointment. And I tell them that I just want to call them, introduce myself, and I like to find out if there's any particular concerns they have for when they come in so that we can be better able to address what their concerns are. This is the beginning of creating a relationship. Doctors will tell you that oftentimes patients coming in for a first time are some of the patients that cancel or don't show the most frequently. And that's because they don't have a relationship already. They've maybe had a referral. They've seen you on the Internet. They've seen you from some form of advertising. They've driven past your office. But there's no relationship there. That initial call is the beginning of a relationship. And we find a very high success rate in patients keeping the first appointment after they've had some contact from the doctor the night before. Um, Place a value on, on how they concretize that relationship when you get in the office. Is there a window there that they slide open and they say, here, fill this out? Or are they made to feel like they're a guest in your home? 
You know, are they are they shown where the the lavatory is? Are they shown all the things that can that the office does to make them feel comfortable? And knowing that it that it's a emotionally charged environment, um, respect for time. You know, patients' time is just as valuable as the doctors. And one of the things that I tell doctors, it's one of the best ways to promote their practice. It's also one of the best ways to keep patients is to start out on time, run on time, and get out on time, and respect patients' time in that way. And that will all automatically give them a greater deal of respect for you as, as a, a care provider. Um, they're so accustomed to going to physician's office these, these, these days and waiting for hours for an appointment, and they don't feel like anything more than a number. Yeah. We want to make them feel that they're a, a participant in a very special dental home. Um, make sure that you give them options for care. Um, while you can prom- you can speak about what the ideal care is, not every patient has that in their mind. And to respect what their needs and their interests are and try to some- come to some compromise on the treatment that they will render as long as it's within the sound principles of practicing dentistry. And then the bottom line is to practice quality care and, and a quality level of caring um, That's the responsibility we have as a practitioner to provide the highest quality care we can. So I would hope that every doctor is going to um, substantial amounts of continuing education and in-service training with their teams and constantly doing the things to stay on the cusp with technology and procedures as well. What are the challenges that dentists face in terms of being able to provide quality care for their patients? Well, right now, we're facing a very, very difficult period of what I will call commoditization. And commoditization is the pressures that are on um, doctors and dentists alike to make the treating individuals feel indistinguishable from one another. Tremendous pressures from insurance companies to, to drive compensation for doctors down. We're starting to see it in commercial establishments where you have large chains taking over dental practices and having multiple locations. And unfortunately, it's getting to the point where eventually you're going to see dentistry in Walmart and Kmart. And if you don't think that it's going to be in dentistry, ask some of the podiatrists and the accountants now about what they think of the Walmart and Kmart mm-hmm. you know, ser- professional services. So a lot of these things that you listed really help the dentist to decommoditize what they do to help the patient see that there is a difference between absolutely dental it, it's raising what the perceived value is within the environment. Most people, in the back of their mind, want quality care, and if they're made to feel that the perceived value of that care is of a certain level, they will sometimes understand the need to make compromises in their in however else they were going to um, focus some of their discretionary dollars on. And they may start to focus it more on, on the dental care and, and health care. Mm-hmm. What, uh, you know, patients, do you think that dental insurance has, uh, helps people select the right dentist or is an impediment to people selecting the right dentist? I think when, when dental insurance first came about, it was a tremendous help to people. It certainly... Um, gave them the ability to at least start to, to have their dental needs met. Unfortunately, dental insurance has not evolved with both cost of living increases and the rising cost of health care. And you find some companies that have not increased the amount that they give as benefits for 30 years, mm-hmm. like in the early 70s. Have they increased the premiums during those times? <laughs> I'm sure they have. You know, patients, patients are paying more out of their pay for these, for these health care um, providers. And, and with that, it really is not insurance. Patients, unfortunately, don't understand fully that dental insurance is not like their, their medical insurance. It really is no more than a supplemental payment. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's capped out at a very inadequate amount. So... For anyone needing any substantial amount of care, unfortunately, it is going to be something that they need to um, take out of their own pocket. You know, you described to us, you know, the the quality office or maybe some of the things the patient should look for, uh, running on time, a nice facility, friendly staff, spending mm-hmm. time, and just chatting with the dentist for 15 or 20 minutes before mm-hmm. the appointment. 
can those things exist within a practice that just takes people's insurance, whatever the insurance pays? It can. Um, number one, most of the doctors who are taking insurance do not take advantage of the best way of processing some of the benefits that are afforded to the to patients. Um, I think if they were to would become more aware of how to use the codes that are provided for, they could begin to provide better care and um, have patients accept care. It's also letting patients become a partner in their care and having them take some degree of ownership over the conditions that they present with. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, a lot of dentists take it on themselves that they view it as almost their problem when a patient comes to them with some presenting need. It truly is the patient's problem, and they have to feel ownership on it. When they feel ownership over the problem, they've been demonstrated properly by um, adequate x-rays and clinical photography and intraoral photographs that show them the condition, then they become more in tune to wanting that condition taken care of. Mm -hmm. The patient's asking for it rather than the dentist almost telling. The Correct. patient's saying, what can I do? Mm -hmm. So what can patients do to select the best dentist uh, for their needs, you know, in light of some of the challenges that are facing dentists in providing quality care? Sure. Now, what, what can patients do? Right. What can, what can patients do to select the best dentist for their needs? Okay. First, you can, you can depend on referrals mm -hmm. of friends, and that's probably the best way. Somebody who you trust and who you respect, who's been through similar care in an office, will give you the proper guidance in directing you to that office. But we have a new era now, the electronic age, the, tech, the technical age, where people coming in who have been referred through the Internet are just almost as strong as those coming in referred because they come in with so much knowledge about you. They've viewed websites that have all of your bios on it and descriptions of the procedures you do and pictures of your team. So they already have some acquaintance. And then on top of that, through some of the search engines, there are evaluations that are given. So they have some feedback on what other people's experiences have been in your office. So I, I beg dentists to start to take advantage of of. bit before about, um, you know, sort of all the things that you do to, to um, uh, develop trust with a patient. Um, but again, we said that most, most of those things aren't things that dentists routinely do. And I would ask you why that is. Why, does, why is that the, you know, when you go to Disneyland, you have a consistently exceptional experience. That's engineered into going to Disneyland. Or when you buy an Apple computer, you know, the great brands all have that exceptional experience built into it. Why is that not the norm in the dental practice? I just, unfortunately, most dentists have gone through dental school and they've been trained in the clinical aspects of it, but there is so much more involved in how to successfully run a practice. There are things to take into account with people skills. I recommend that dentists go for training outside of their field to, um, to speak with psychologists about how to, how to speak to people, to read books in business on how to run a successful business. I'm a firm believer in staff training and for uh, using scripting so that there's a consistent positive message coming from all those who work in the practice. Uh, I tell patients, I tell doctors to use the information from those around them, whether it's um, the guidance of, of other dentists or other professionals, uh, to read outside the field, uh, to speak to dental sales reps are a, a beautiful source of information on what's being done successfully in other practices, um, to enlist the help of professionals like myself in, in coaching. Um, the hardest thing for dentists is change. Mm -hmm. If they've been doing something the same way for many years, it's very difficult for them to break out of that paradigm and do things differently. It's, it's kind of like a trapeze artist. If, if the release is done too early or too late, the person falls. If the catch is not done crisply, the fall. So that uh, a coach or a consultant like myself can serve as like the safety net for a doctor who is um, looking to make changes in his practice for the positive. How does the typical coaching client come to you? In other words, 
you know, is the is the client ready to receive the message typically when they come to you and they're ready to change, or do you have to coax them to the point where they have to realize they need to change? Over the last few years, there have been, unfortunately, with the effects of the economy, a lot of dentists who have encountered struggles that they have related to the economy. And have, as they've seen some of their practices decline, they have lost sight of what they have within their own power to make changes that can reverse the trend. You know, unfortunately, we have seen some who have gone waited too long, and it's very difficult for them to turn around. But those who are who have gotten to us in time and are receptive to what we recommend and and uh, start to implement some of the changes we we recommend, we've seen tremendous turnarounds and growth um, from fifty percent all the way up to a hundred percent. When dentists come to you, do they think my situation's hopeless? Oftentimes they do, but you know what I explain to them is what I went through mm-hmm. and, and really what I feel was going to hell and back, that I have some empathy for what they go through when they're struggling, and I think my story is as much a story of hope as it is of success, that they, they can have the same success if they apply themselves in the proper way. What does it feel like if you've taken a, a practice that was maybe struggling or just paying its bills and then you, you double their practice or triple their practice? It's, it's got to be a great feeling. It's, it really is wonderful, and I'm very fortunate right now to have quite a few practices here on Long Island that have shown this level of success. I've been able to create some great relationships with these doctors. Um, I feel a real camaraderie with them, and I, I just feel very proud. You know, you get a double double dose of good karma. You know, when you do good for patients, mm-hmm. they uh, they always appreciate what the dentist did for them, and it comes back to you. And, and when you can help a professional like that, I would imagine it, it just comes back double. You really not only change his life, but change his whole family's life and what happens to his family from there. So it's, it's got to be very fulfilling. When we talk started, you know, my belief system is based on the fact that I want to make a positive change in people's lives. And it's not just my patients. It's my family. It's the people around me in social situations and it's for the doctors I work with on a coaching basis. Just to wrap up real quickly, if somebody's listening, you know, maybe a dentist is listening and wants to get involved with you in coaching, uh, how do they do that? How can they reach you? Uh, You can reach me at my website, uh, smilepotential.com. Our email is smilepotential at aol.com. And my office phone number is 516-599-0883. Steve, this was a great show. I really enjoyed hey, talking to you tonight you. and that, that, special, uh, that special experience you create for the patients and for the dentists out of your clients. So thanks for coming down. That's great. Thank you. You've been listening to Healthy Living Radio. I'm your host, Dr. David Scharf. We'll be back on the radio next Thursday. Thanks for listening. You've been listening to Healthy Living Radio with your host, Dr. David Scharf. Join us next week for another edition of Healthy Living Radio. 